Hello everybody, TRS instructor Derek Smith here. Yesterday in California, there was another mass shooting where 10 people were killed and 10 was injured. So I thought it was my duty. I thought it was very important for me to come on and talk to you all today about how to survive a public shooting, how to survive a shooting in general. So I know that the odds of being involved in a mass shooting are relatively low, but public shootings have increased drastically over the last few years. It seems like every time we turn on the television, there's another mass shooting going on, another public shooting going on somewhere. And because of that, I felt like I really needed to do this video. Hey, before I get into everything, I've got a quick announcement. Fight Fast has put together some ultra brutal fight ending moves that you two won't allow on their platform. They're pretty ugly, but when it hits the fan and your life is on the line, you'll be glad you know these. This legal training is yours for free. Just get to the description below and click on the link. So, you know, in a moment of crisis, it can be easy to feel frightened, overwhelmed, confused. So knowing how to react appropriately in that type of situation can increase your chance of survival and that of others around you should you ever find yourself in danger. So in this video, I'm going to talk to you quite a bit about how to survive, you know, uh, this type of situation, what you can do in it, and help you understand the situation as well. So let's jump right into it. So with the terror of mass shootings happening around the country and the globe in general, people all over the country are reevaluating survival tactics for these type of events. And the general consensus is that the decisions you make in that first few minutes will largely determine whether you live or die. So it's easy for us to mourn the dead and tell ourselves that victims were trapped and had no choices. But while such events are terrifying, and can be extremely lethal for people stuck in an area with a psychopath bent on massacring as many innocents as possible, you still get to vote on the outcome of the situation, how that situation is going to come out for you. Your survival is largely dependent on correctly assessing the initial attack, orienting yourself as to the location and probable heading of the assailant, where they're trying to get to, and then making the correct decision when it comes to your response. So no matter what you do, it's going to be high stakes with no room for error. But if you act correctly and have just a little bit of luck on your side, it's entirely possible, even likely, that you will survive a mass shooting rampage. So in this video, I'm going to be presenting you with tips, procedures, and advice to help you accomplish just that. All right, so let's get into it. Let's talk about first, what is a mass shooting? There's no completely conclusive and widely accepted definition of a mass shooting. And if you ask, the answer you will receive varies from person to person and organization to organization. Perhaps the best definition in modern times is one codified by a law passed by the United States Congress. It's called the Investigative Assistance for Violent Crimes Act of 2012. And this act defines a mass killing as one in which three victims die, excluding the perpetrator. But this is not entirely firearm specific. We can also look to the Congressional Research Service, which defines a mass public shooting as opposed to domestic violence, gang-related shootouts, or some other similar form of mass murder as a multiple homicide in which four or more victims died by gunshot in one or multiple locations inside the scope of a single event. Now, that's all informative, right? This is informative, but for our purposes, a mass shooting is any event where a single or multiple attackers decide to light up a crowd of people at any given venue with gunfire. Nothing else matters as far as um, specifics go. And although most agencies make a clear distinction between terrorism perpetrated with guns and a mass shooting, your initial response does not change no matter who's pulling the trigger or why. We don't care about who's pulling the trigger or why they're pulling the trigger. So these various definitions of mass shootings um, are, are nice for record keeping and all that. But no matter how you square it, Instances of mass shooting occur more and more frequently in the United States and other places around the world, as a fact. But the United States alone is leading the pack. Since 2013, we've had about 2,000 mass shootings recorded. So putting aside all that administrative record keeping, all you need to know is that someone wants to rack up a high body count for some purpose, be it their own fame or to further their warped ideology, whatever that might be. So your response to either or some other reason is going to be the same. So let's talk about how we deal with a mass shooting. So I think you will agree that mass shootings are terrifying. One moment you're enjoying some peaceful, fun activity surrounded by your friends and family. 
and all the other people that have gathered together for whatever occasion you might be attending, and the very next second, oh my God, I'm so gunfire is ringing out, screams are filling the air, and you're afraid and you're trying to figure out what's going on. The stench of burnt propellant, blood, excrement is going to assault your nostrils as your mind whirls around searching for the source of the danger and at the same time trying desperately to plot your own escape. So what do you do? Where do you go? Are all your people accounted for? Should you try to help somebody else? Can you help anybody else? As you're probably thinking, it's definitely not the time for I'll figure it out right now once the shooting starts and the body starts to hit the floor. Now, it's extremely difficult to predict specifically how any given mass shooting is going to go down, but most contain largely similar elements that are more or less well understood in our time. We can use this information to our advantage and let it inform our responses to these events. So in general, there are three options that you have for dealing with a mass shooter. You can run, you can hide, or you can fight. You need to know how to do each one of those things well, and indeed you might have to employ all three of them in the course of your survival. I'm going to get to the nitty gritty of each one of those in just a little bit. But first, I want to delve a little more deeply into understanding how an active shooter works. Many of the mass casualty events that we've seen are perpetrated by what has become to be defined as active shooters. Now, this definition is somewhat tenuous even today, as everybody has their own spin on what is or is not an active shooter. But there's one definition that serves as a sort of benchmark for the term, and it's the one that's used by multiple government agencies like the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, and even the White House uses this. They all define an active shooter as an individual actively engaged in killing or attempted to kill people in a confined and populated area. Probably exactly what you were already thinking or pretty close to it. Now, why take the time to define an active shooter so precisely? As it turns out, the typical active shooter exhibits several common characteristics, and many of the mass shooting events we are preparing for play out in a disturbingly similar fashion. Anytime there's a pattern, anytime we can recognize heightened probability, we can use that information to study the threat and formulate better countermeasures. So when we look at mass shootings, most active shootings take place at businesses or schools or some type of event. The vast majority of active shooters choose a commercial building or business or a school structure as the venue of their attack. Together, these locations represent the most popular for these killers telling about 70% of all active shooting incidents that have occurred. So it's no coincidence that these places are almost commonly encountered as a gun-free zone, meaning that potential victims are even less likely to be armed and able to put up any type of meaningful resistance because they don't have a gun. So if you spend a lot of time in a commercial building or an educational institution, you're going to have to be even more on guard for a mass shooting event than other people are. If you get practice or training to deal with an active shooter, say at your job or something like that, you should be practicing in and around buildings that closely replicate typical commercial and educational, educational spaces. Now, active shooters are almost always lone wolves. It's extremely rare for an active shooting event to have more than one shooter. Now, these guys and sometimes girls almost never go into a cooperative duo with one another. Instead, they act out alone. You know, they take their evil plans and they act them out alone. So generally speaking, less than 2% of the time will an active shooter be perpetrated by more than one shooter. You can use this information to your advantage to make quick decisions. So if you know exactly where the shooting is taking place, you can move away from that location at best speed and undercover, generally free from the fear that you're going to run into an accomplice. This information can also inform your decision to fight. As enlisting multiple people to help you means you have a major advantage over the gunman once you come to grips with that person. He most likely would not have any backup in the area that's going to swoop in and try to help him out. Now, I'll tell you this. Time is of the essence. Most active incidents are over and done within five minutes. With all the death and mayhem that's going to be inflicted completely meted out within that period of time. A smaller but significant fraction are concluded within three minutes. This means that you have to act fast to improve your situation if you want to avoid getting hurt or killed. Run, hide, fight. Your fate is going to be decided in just a couple of minutes. 
The brisk tempo of these events can also inform other decisions that you're going to have to make. Typically, you cannot count on police arriving in time to make any meaningful difference. Also, the notion that you can retreat to your vehicle, grab your gear or your weapons, and then return to save the day is pretty laughable, actually. Though, I mean, it's well-intentioned, but it's not going to happen. There have been scarce few instances where civilians have been able to do exactly that. But a toll in blood and lives is being reaped the entire time that you're thinking about that. So chances are, if you're going to make a difference in the outcome yourself, you only have time to access what is already on your body or close at hand before it's all over. The next thing is the active shooter usually decides when it stops. So a little more than half the time, the active shooter will decide when the event is over. Not the police and not citizens, be they armed or unarmed. This is going to usually take place in one of two ways. The shooter either kills himself at the scene when confronted or cornered, or they simply finish shooting and leave. Only 4% of the time is the active shooter stopped by an armed citizen or a police officer. Perhaps most surprisingly, unarmed citizens enact more successful stops than armed citizens, halting and attacking 13% of active shooter incidents. This is likely because, again, many of them take place in gun-free zones, and most citizens do not carry a gun at any rate. The latter eventuality is a particular interest if the shooter decides to stop killing at one location. There's an increasing trend among people that perpetrate these types of crimes where they leave one location only to travel a short distance to another one and resume the slaughter. For switched on citizens, this means you must be on your toes if you hear about a shooting taking place anywhere nearby, as it could be a matter of only a few minutes before that shooter potentially shows up at your location. So active shootings are on the rise. This particular point, is contentious due to the way that the FBI defined active shooter and which categories of shooting they chose to include. The skills you learn and the preparations you put in place are going to serve you in many emergencies, not just active shooter ones. So let's jump into some mass shooting survival tips. First, always maintain a relaxed state of awareness, especially when you are in a large gathering or crowded venue or high profile event. Generic mass shooters desire infamy, which means they want to be famous above all else, and routinely attempt to outdo the body count of mass shooters from past events in order to get what might be called the high score. So violence can obviously occur anywhere, but typical mass shooting is going to occur at some place packed with defenseless civilians. Think shopping malls, theaters, schools, things like that. Second thing is don't fall victim to normalcy bias. So normalcy bias is where your brain betrays you by telling you that what you're seeing is actually something other than what's really happening. It explains why some people watch a madman walk into a department store with a rifle and he's carrying it in poor arms well ahead of the actual shooting taking place. And they take no action to save themselves or other people. They might think the gun is a toy, the person is in costume or is somehow involved in security or law enforcement. And that's a fatal error that they make. If you see anything that looks suspicious or dangerous, you need to act on it immediately. Next is learn to recognize pre-attack indicators. Pre-attack indicators are a set of behavioral cues, ticks, and actions that might tip you off someone is in a heightened state of anxiety or excitement and are typically exhibited by people who are preparing to commit violence against others. Noticing these and correctly assessing them in the context of the environment can tip you off that a mass shooting is about to occur and reward you with a few second head start on the proceedings, which could mean the difference between you escaping unarmed or you bleeding out on the ground. Next is don't pull a fire alarm or set off any sprinklers during a mass shooting. This is very important as doing so might give potential victims a false sense of security about the situation. And they can see the fire department dispatches first responders not knowing exactly what they're walking into. At best, this creates chaos and confusion among command and control elements of police and other emergency services. Keep these things in mind as I go through various options. So I'm going to give you different methods or options for surviving a public shooting. Number one, you want to assess the situation. Remain calm. It's natural to panic in an emergency like a public shooting, but panicking causes people to react emotionally rather than thoughtfully. It may seem impossible to keep calm during an emergency, but there's a few things you can do to remain (sighs) level-headed. Focus on your breathing. 
Count to three while breathing in. Hold your breath to the count of three, then exhale to the count of three. You can and you should do this while moving to safety, but controlling your breath can keep you from hyperventilating or making rash decisions. Next is alert others. Once you realize that there's an active shooter situation, you should alert other people nearby. Some people may not have noticed that an incident has been unfolding, while others may be frozen with fear. So announce to everybody else around you that you believe there's an active shooter situation and that everybody needs to get out of there, or at least needs to go somewhere to hide. Then know your plan. It's imperative that you have a plan in place of what to do in case of an emergency. So training and preparation can help you escape to safety, but remember to always have a backup plan. If you can't follow your primary plan, evaluate whether or not you can follow a backup plan. Next is prepare to run. So many people freeze up in an emergency. If a shooter is active, you may feel the urge to remain still and hide. However, experts advise that hiding should be only an option if you cannot safely escape. If you know an escape route that's going to keep you at a safe distance from the shooter, resist the urge to freeze up and force yourself to run as long as you can do so in a safe manner. Let's move on to method number two. Method number two is run into safety. And the first step is visualize your movements. It's important to plan your escape route and be aware of your surroundings. If there are possible positions along the route where the shooter could potentially ambush you or others, recognize this and then anticipate how you would respond if this was to happen. Most shooters aim at arbitrary targets. The harder you are to see and hit, the safer you're going to be. So try to be rational and avoid entering into the shooter's line of sight. If you're in the vicinity of the shooter, try to find an escape route that gives you both concealment to stay out of view of the shooter and cover to protect you from bullets. The second part of that is get out if you can. When an active shooter is in your vicinity, even though you're afraid, it's important to keep moving and to get as far away from the situation as um, possible, as far away from that shooter as possible. Don't stick around to watch or figure out what's going on, but put as much distance between you and that shooter. This is gonna make it difficult for the shooter to shoot you and reduces the chances that you'll be shot by random fire. Note that this is only possible if the shooter has not noticed you. If you are lost in a crowd or if you hear gunshots from a distance but have not yet seen the shooter, then you can probably get away. If you can help others without endangering yourself, try to do so. Try to escape even if others insist on staying. Encourage other people you pass to leave with you. However, if others are uncertain about running, don't wait for them to decide. It's important that you get out there first and foremost. That's what you want to do. The third part of that is leave your stuff. Remember that your life is what's important, not your phone, not your other belongings. Don't delay your escape trying to grab material items. And if you see somebody else trying to gather their things, tell them to leave that crap alone and get the heck out of there. The fourth part of that is use any exit you can. Take any exit you can to escape, including emergency exits and emergency windows. Most restaurants, movie theaters, uh, other public places have doors and exits designated for staff, like in stock rooms and kitchens, for example. So look for those and use those if possible. And the fifth part of this one for method number two is call emergency services. Once you're removed from the situation and have made a safe exit, call 911 or find someone with a phone to make the call. Stay as far away from the building as possible once you're outside. Prevent passerbys and others from entering the situation. Alert people outside of the building what's happening inside and advise them to also stay as far away as possible. Let's move to method number three, and that's hiding from a shooter. So first part of that is find a hiding spot. Choose a spot that is out of the shooter's visual field and that can provide um, protection if shots are fired your way. So ideally, your hiding place should not trap you and make you a sitting duck. An ideal hiding place should have adequate space for you to move and escape if you need to. Be quick and deciding where to hide. Try to secure a place to hide as soon as you can. If you can't find a room with a door that can lock the hide in, try to hide behind something that can conceal your body, like a photocopy or a following cabinet. Second part is keep quiet. Turn off the lights, if there are lights, and be silent. Be sure to turn off both your phone's ringer and its ability to vibrate. Also resist the urge to cough or sneeze, and do not try to talk to anybody else who may be hiding with you. Remember that if you're hiding, the last thing you want to do is have the shooter notice you. Don't call the authorities even though you may be tempted. 
If you're in a populated place, like a restaurant or school, chances are that some people escaped or heard the gunfire and they're gonna alert the police. The third part of this method number three is block the hiding spot. If you're in a room, lock the door or block it with something heavy, like a filing cabinet or a sofa. Make it as difficult as possible for the shooter to enter a room. So making it difficult for the shooter to get into a room keeps you safe and also buys you time. If you or somebody else has called the police, they should respond in a matter of minutes, even just two to three minutes in a significant amount of time in an emergency situation. And number four for method three is stay low and horizontal. Lie on the floor, face down with your arms near but not covering your head. This face down position protects your internal organs. In addition, if the shooter comes across you in this position, he may assume that you're already dead. So laying low to the ground also reduces your chance of being shot by a stray bullet. Keep away from the door. Some shooters are gonna shoot through the locked door rather than try to enter it or break it down. Since bullets can go through doors, it's best to stay away from the doors. Method number four is when you have to fight the shooter, okay? Number one, fight as a last resort. Do not try to fight the shooter if you can safely escape or hide from him. Fighting should be a last resort, but if you have to fight, it's important to go into full survival mode, what I call condition red. Second is find items to use as weapons. Locate anything you can use to hit or harm the shooter, such as a chair or a fire extinguisher or a pot of hot coffee. Most people won't have armed weapons on hand, so you need to improvise and use what you got around you. You can hold the object in front of your body to deflect the shots, or you can throw it into the shooter. Scissors or letter openers can be used as a knife. Even a pen can be used as a weapon if you know how to use it, particularly since you give it leverage with the back of your hand and your thumb. Boom, hit that person with that. If there's a fire extinguisher nearby, grab it. You can spray the fire extinguisher in the shooter's face or use the object itself to bash the shooter in the head. The third part of method number four is incapacitate that shooter. Fighting back against the shooter is always the last resort, as I told you before. But if your life is endangered, if you cannot escape or hide, work alone or with others to fight. Try to find a way to get the gun out of his hands or to knock him down to disorient him. Encourage others to try and help you. Working as a group is going to give you an advantage over a solitary shooter. Fourth part of method four is be physically aggressive. If your shooter is very close, you could try to disarm them. Again, only if life is absolutely in danger, okay? Whatever you do, it's important that you act fast and focus on disarming or incapacitating that shooter. So if the shooter has a rifle, grab the barrel and turn it away from you while striking or kicking him at the same time. The shooter is gonna likely try to get control of the weapon back, but if you follow his movement, he may be caught off guard and get thrown off balance. If you can get the butt end of the rifle as well, then you have both ends and you can use the weapon as leverage to further kick him or knee him or punish that or, or push that person. If the shooter has a pistol, try to grab it by the barrel from the top so that he cannot point it at you. With many models, grabbing the pistol from the top keeps the gun from cycling properly. So while the already chambered round will fire, the next round won't be chambered without manually racking the slide. Try to aim high when attempting to bring down the shooter. His hands and the weapons are the most dangerous part of him during the shooting. Otherwise, try to hit him in the face or in his eyes or shoulder or neck. And the fifth part of method number four is stay committed. Even though you may be scared, particularly if you're armed with a broom and you know the shooter has an assault rifle, stay focused on getting that rifle out of his hands and bringing him down. Think of your life and the lives of others he may be after. Fortunately, your body's natural fight response should be triggered and keep you alert and focused on staying alive whatever the cost might be. Now, the last method, method five, is receiving help. The first part is remain calm. If you've escaped the situation, try to breathe deeply. Chances are that you may be experiencing feelings of panic or shock or numbness due to the trauma. So it's best to try to get your bearings by centering your focus on your breathing. So when you feel that you're able to talk, you should call your family and loved ones to let them know that you're all right. Second thing is keep your hands visible at all times. Law enforcement's first task, and I'm telling you this as a former law enforcement officer, is to stop the shooter. So as you emerge from the building or public place, always keep your hands up so that we know that you're not carrying a weapon. Police are trained to initially treat someone as a suspect since some shooters pretend to be um, victims. The third part of that is avoid pointing or yelling. 
The police have specific guidelines on how to proceed during a public shooting. Let them do their jobs and don't confuse or aggravate the situation by intervening, particularly since your emotions are likely heightened. Let them do their jobs effectively and they're going to take down the shooter. The fourth part and the final is know that help for the injured is coming. The police are trained to locate and stop shooters and this is their primary goal. They will not stop and tend to the injured, but you needn't worry as paramedics have likely already been called to care for those shot or otherwise hurt during the incident. If you have been shot, try to slow your breathing, which can help prevent shock and slow the bleeding. Cover the wound with your hands or a cloth and apply pressure to try to stop the bleeding until you can get medical attention, medical help. So in conclusion for this video, your natural instinct in a mass shooting will often be to make the wrong moves. The only way to avoid this is to stay calm and think through the correct actions to take. It is easy to become a cowboy or to panic, but do not let your pride or your fear control you. Like any survival situation, logic, coolness, training is going to tell you what to do if you let it. So use your head and you'll likely come out of it alive. All right, everybody, um, it was a bad situation. Um, I hate to have to do a video like this, but I hope this helps you. If you enjoyed this video and videos like it, please go ahead and click the like button. And I'll see you in the next video. Hey, one last thing. Remember to get these ultra brutal fight ending moves. These are free, but they're so nasty and brutal that YouTube simply won't allow Fight Fast to show them on this platform. Again, this legal training is yours for nothing. Just get to the description below and click on the link.